Paul has been a family friend now for a few years, and I have to say that I have learned more from watching him interact in the moment with the individual. It's been a blessing, and I consider him a dear friend and a mentor. We are blessed to have him here at Emmanuel. For those of you who don't know William Paul Young, have never heard him speak before, he is the author of The Shack, which currently sits at number 50 on the top 100 books ever sold in the history of the world. The Bible's number one. The Shack has sold 19 million copies worldwide. Crossroads is his newest book. If you'd like to purchase either book, I mentioned Ruth's uh, Christian bookstore at the beginning of the service. They're available in the foyer. Tonight, come back. You'll stay as long as you need for him to sign it for you. What's fascinating about today is Paul and his wife Kim are in Nashville with their daughter who's going through some schooling on uh, professional makeup for video. And he came to us from Detroit. He's here for today tomorrow. Um, in other words, he's away from his family to be with us. Six kids. And what's fascinating is he doesn't know what he's going to say until the moment he says it. So every service this morning, beginning at 8.30, then 9.30, 11 o'clock in refuge is watching the video from 8.30, and it's packed in there. And then here, something different. Um, you'll want to get the CDs, because we've already had two of the most powerful talks I've ever heard. Well, you're privileged to hear him again. Let's give to Paul Young a warm Emmanuel welcome. <laughs> he has to like me. I have William Paul, like William Paul Burleson. Just so you know. It's great to be with you. Hey, Chase. How you doing, bud? Good. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, uh, let me read you a bit of an email that I got. Hi, my name is Aram. This is not an email to me. It was actually posted on somebody's blog that they wrote about uh, the shack. Now, Baptist-like disclaimers, so I thought I'd make one. I'm not a Baptist, but, you know, I like disclaimers. They have them for the shack. So, um, Wade and the staff here and Emmanuel is not responsible for anything that comes out of my mouth. Because <laughs> it could be wrong. I'm just saying, right? I'm just like a human being like you. Right? I, I wrote a book for my kids for Christmas and made 15 copies at Office Depot and went back to work because I've never published anything, wasn't trying to, and here I am. Yeah, I'm not that impressed either. So <laughs> my girls have told me, they said, Dad, you have so ruined the idea of celebrity for us. <laughs> so <laughs> my name is Aram. I just finished reading The Shack. I then went online and happened across a bunch of people arguing about it for what looks like a few years now. <laughs> people are calling it heresy and a dangerous book and warning people not to read it. Oh, by the way, <laughs> which is true. People have warned people not to read it. And I told the story this morning about my mom who called my sister and said, your brother is a heretic, you know? So that's my mom, right? So, so you know the, the book Blue Like Jazz is Donald Miller? Well, Donald's a friend of mine. He calls me up and he says, hey, Paul, if I could get what's his, you know, he mentions the guy's name who's a pastor. He says, if I could get him to ban my next book, do you think he would? Because I could really use a bestseller. So there's a verse in Romans that says, where the law comes, sin abounds. Yeah, ban my book. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He says, I normally never comment on these things, but being an unbeliever, yep, I'm not a Christian, I thought it might be useful for some theology-spouting people to take a moment and look at what I, not a churchgoer in any way, have gleaned from this little book, and then ask yourself, because I really don't know how much of the, about the Bible, if anything, 
And I don't know if this is leading me in the wrong direction, perhaps all the way to the burning lake of fire that lots of Christians try loving to scare non-Christians into believing by. If this is the case, then I guess you're right, and based on what you believe, people shouldn't read this book. For me, I don't believe fear and rules are the answer, and I never have. It's a main reason for my avoidance of the church. However, if you preach love and forgiveness through whatever means conveys it the best, whether fiction or otherwise, while well, my heart begins to open a tab, and it actually makes me want to maybe pick up a Bible, perhaps, and maybe read a little bit further. So teach love, my Christian friends, because people like me, we don't respond well to fear tactics. And we definitely don't get turned on by arrogant people who think they've got it all figured out. So, below I've listed 57 new ideas I took away from this little book. I'm, go I'm not going to read you all of them, but I'll read you the first dozen so you get a feel for this. Right? Number one, the different appearances of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit were used to help Mac break his religious conditioning. Two, you don't get brownie points for doing things through obligation. Three, life takes a lot of time and a lot of relationship. Four, now get this. How free are we really? Family genetics, social influences, personal habits, advertising, propaganda, paradigms. Freedom is an incremental process that happens inside a relationship with Jesus Christ. Five, when all you can see is your pain, perhaps you're losing sight of God. That actually, where'd Wade go? He's at refuge. Oh, so, so much for that. <laughs> he and I were talking about, and this actually is profoundly right on, right on task. Six, pain has a way of clipping your wings so you can't fly. After a while, we forget we were ever created to fly. Seven, when Jesus became a man, he gave up his own ability to heal people and do miracles. His miracles were accomplished by his, a dependent man, human being, his trust in the Father God. We're all designed to live like this, out of God's life and power. Eight, God exists in three persons so we, his creation, can also live in love and relationship like God does. If God didn't, we couldn't. God can't act apart from love. Number nine, relationships are never supposed to be about power. And one way to avoid power and wanting it is to limit yourself, to serve someone else. Ten, sin is its own punishment, and one way, uh, devouring from the inside. It's not God's purpose to punish it, it's his purpose to cure it. Now, I would add one thing to that. I think it's God's intention to destroy it. See, I believe in the wrath of God. I believe that God is a fiery love, because I'm a father. And if I had a daughter who questions the value of who she is at the core because she has started to believe some lies, I want to be a burning fury that goes into that lie and burns it out of existence. Why? Because she disappointed me? No, because I love her. Same with if I had a son who was an addict, you don't think I'd want to climb inside that addiction and just destroy it? It is fueled by love, not by retribution, as if God's righteousness has been offended. He doesn't need anything. He's here because of love, and that's who God is. Number 11, when people choose independence over relationship, they become a danger to each other. 12, if people regard, learn to regard each other's concerns as significant as their own, there would be no need for any hierarchy. God doesn't relate inside a hierarchy. 
God wants us to trust him because he'll never use or hurt us. Those are the first 12 of 57. He, whoever Aram is, male or female, gets this response, a comment about this comment, right? And the response is this. Hey, Aram, only an unbeliever could have your clarity and insight. <laughs> is that great? Believers' minds tend to be so clouded and controlled by their beliefs. Believers can't think clearly. Every bit of information is evaluated not for its truth, wisdom, or usefulness, but whether or not it's consistent with what is already believed. You appear to have derived so much more from the shack than a lot of believers will be able to. They'll reject the insight simply because it differs from their paradigm, and they'll miss the benefits you gain from the book. Well done. Don't ever let believers interfere with whatever your walk with God turns out to be. Yeah, baby. Okay. Yeah, isn't that fun? It's really cool. All right. So I thought at the beginning of this morning that the first service I was going to talk about mothers and sons, which I kind of did. I thought the second service I was going to talk about male and female, which I didn't. But that doesn't surprise me. I, you know, any time that I usually think I know what I'm doing, I end up not doing it. So it's kind of like whatever. So I ended up talking about fathers and sons. And especially like... Jesus' relationship to his father. And, and so we're going to go somewhere that is going to challenge some of your paradigm. I'm just warning you. All right? So remember, he's just an ordinary person who is cleaning toilets and shipping out soldering tips, right? You know? Okay. Now, the last statement in Aram's list said that if we knew how to relate to each other properly, that there would be no need for hierarchy, which is true. And then he says, because there's no hierarchy in the Trinity, which is also true. Now, you may not know this, because we kind of need hierarchy in the Trinity, because we need hierarchy, because relationships way messier than hierarchy. It's way easier just to tell somebody what to do, right? Not to relate to them. So, in every uh, Christian tradition, there has been this thing, there's a statement in theology that goes something like this. The eternal subordination of the Son to the Father. Okay? It's hierarchy. And every Christian tradition, Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox, have agreed, they don't agree about, you know, lots of stuff, but this they agree about that that statement is heresy. The idea that the Son is eternally subordinate to the Father is heresy. There is no hierarchy in the Trinity. The early church never believed in a hierarchy in the Trinity. Is there submission? Absolutely. Is the Father submitted to the Son? Absolutely. Is the Son submitted to the Father? Absolutely. Is the Spirit submitted to the Son? Yes. So how do we understand submission if we don't understand it within a paradigm of hierarchy? You understand it in a paradigm of relationship, in this mutual movement that happens. Okay, so there is this verse. I, you probably never heard it quoted. It is, goes like this. Wives, submit to your husbands. It's in Ephesians, if you didn't know. And that's in the New Testament, if you didn't know. So, it's, it's, and actually it starts a paragraph. Now, you've got to understand that paragraphs don't actually exist. Not like in the original languages and stuff. I mean, they didn't even have punctuation. So, I mean, it doesn't exist. But we put a paragraph in, while we being the men, right, who did the translation work. So we like putting in paragraphs into places that, where they don't belong because it helps with our paradigms. Like, and we like translating things in ways that they're not really real, but they sound good to us because we like the power that we have. So like, for example, Genesis chapter 1, you're introduced to the Holy Spirit. Do you know that ruach, which is the word for your breath, in and out, and the word for the Spirit of God, ruach, 
is feminine. It's feminine. And the verbs are feminine. It should be translated, and the spirit she hovered and fluttered over the deep and dark. Oh, okay. Guys, we translate. So we don't put the she in there. But, kind of, you know, we don't want anybody to think that we believe that God is a woman. Now, we do want them to think that God is a man. Orthodox theology, God is neither male nor female. Now, when somebody is telling you a narrative, you know, I grew up in the, in the church. I'm a Protestant, evangelical, missionary kid, preacher's kid. Trained religious to the core, right? There were a whole bunch of questions that we were not allowed to ask growing up in the church. Well, if you ask them, you ended up with this verse quoted to you. I don't know if you've ever heard it, but I heard it plenty, and it was this. Rebellion is worse than witchcraft. Don't ask. Right? So there were a lot of these questions, and when I wrote The Shack, I'm writing a book for my children for Christmas, and our youngest turns 20 next month, our oldest is 32, we have four boys, two girls, we have six grandbabies, four girls, two boys, they're five and under, we have a seventh grandbaby who my heart is fully given to as if she were here, or if one of my daughters or daughter-in-laws was pregnant, and it's a little girl named Maisie from Uganda. And we are working, our son and daughter-in-law are adopting her. But we have her pictures, they've changed her name, and I'm in. Right? I'm in. So that's a very tender place for uh, us all. Now, the change in the narrative makes all this difference. Right? We know God's not male or female. Now, when I wrote the shack, I'm trying to play with imagery because imagery doesn't define God. It helps us understand the nature and character of God. Now, think about this. Talk about changing. Uh, and Well, let me go step back one little bit. One of the questions that I grew up with that I wasn't allowed to ask among the many was this. If men are so much more screwed up than women, how come they're in charge? Now, you know, that's when you hear rebellious is, rebellion is worse than witchcraft, right? But I'm thinking, really, come on. It seems kind of obvious to me. Most of my damage came from men. Now, it doesn't mean that women don't have the power to damage. They definitely do. But you start looking at the statistics in this world, how many times have you heard of a women's militia group that tied men to a tree and raped them all day long so that they needed reconstructive surgery? It's happening right now in the Congo. How many brothels exist for women? You begin to look at the damage in this world and you will begin to see that men are at the core of it. Now, Scripture agrees with that. Through one male, sin entered the world. Why do you think? Now, do you think that Jesus, the Word of God, prior to the incarnation was male? No. Why did he become male? because it was the deepest place of the loss of the human race. If through one male sin enters the world, the word has got to become incarnate as a male to go to the place of greatest loss. Does that make sense to you? And he has to do it apart from the will of a male or from the seed of a male. And there you begin to understand the virgin birth. And guess what? All us guys, we're going to grow up to be a woman. <laughs> Think about it. Do we, go up, do we grow up to be the groom of Christ? No. We grow up to be the bride of Christ. That's a little unnerving, right? So what's going on here? Little change in the narrative changes everything. 
I worked for 25 years on the issue of my question, if men are so much more messed up than women, how come they're in charge? 25 years, and it led me into the heart of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit relationship. Because I'm thinking, if there is a basis for this, it's got to be inside the relationship of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And there is no hierarchy there. Wives, submit to your husbands. Let me give a spin on that passage. Because you know what? Here's a surprise. In the way that it was written, in Ephesians, when Paul the Apostle penned the words, the word submit is not there. Surprise number one. The word submit isn't there. It doesn't have the word submit. It's just blank. It just says, wives to your husbands. Now, they're using submit when they put it in there. Now, if you have New American Standard, it'll have it in italics, which means it's not in the original language. That's why they use italics, okay? So, they put it in there, and they put it in there as a verb, right? Like this is something that you wives need to do. It's a verb. It's not there. And, surprise number two, it's in the middle of a sentence, and they started a new paragraph. Right? So they cut a sentence in half, started a paragraph, and put a little title above it saying, marriage relationships, or women's relationships to their husbands, or something, right? It's in the middle of a sentence. The word submit's not there. There's no verb there. So, do you, you remember grammar? Not, not grandpa's wife. It's the study of language and how you put things together, right? English, we're not good at this. You have to basically learn a foreign language to figure out, oh, that's what grammar was, you know? So, um, but I'll give you a little grammar lesson. When you have a blank space and you want to put a word in there, you better find where it comes from. You better find what's called the antecedent, right? Because that word came from somewhere. They didn't just say, well, let's use the word submit, right? We'll put a verb in there. Well, so you're not, you got to go find the verb. we got to go find the verb, all right? So we're looking into that passage to find the verb. And guess what? You keep running into adverbial clauses. You remember adverbs? Nouns, person, place, thing, or idea, adjectives modify a noun. Verbs, action words, and adverbs modify action words. So they tell you how something or to what extent something is. Right, adverbial clauses, right? We use them all the time. So we keep running into adverb. We're looking for a verb because you, if you've got adverbial clauses, they modify a verb, right? And they invented one and stuck it in here. So how does this work? So you're going back in this sentence and you run into adverbial phrases, things that tell you about a verb. And the first one you run into is submitting one to another. That's an adverbial clause. And the word submitting is in there. But guess what it says? To who? One to another. Would that include a husband submitting to their wife? Yeah. Would it include a parent submitting to their child? Yes. Would it include a master submitting to his slave? Yes. It's an adverbial clause, so it's modifying a verb. But we still don't know what the verb is. So, we know this so far. When they got to this blank space, they took an adverbial clause and they stuck it in there like a verb. Do you see there's a problem here? And then they started a new paragraph, and you're supposed to think that this verb being used here is actually making sense, right? And it means something different than even the adverbial clause that was the antecedent. Are you following me? I mean, is this like, because this is really fairly crucial. So they took an adverbial clause submitting one to another and they stuck it in here as a verb and said wives submit to your husbands now 
Do we want wives to submit to their husbands? Absolutely. But what happens when you create a new paragraph there and you start this new thought? Now you've got a verb that places a sense upon a woman that is not coming from the adverbial antecedent that says submit one to another. Whatever one to another means, you can't have it mean something different when you stick it in here as a verb that doesn't even exist. Are you following me? So, we still don't know what the verb is. Because the, submitting isn't the verb. That's an adverbial clause that's modifying a verb. We still don't know what the verb is. So we keep climbing up the sentence. And we find singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to one another, right? There's another adverbial clause. It's still modifying a verb. Do you know what the verb is? that everything is modifying, that should be stuck in this place that is way down here in this blank spot? You know what the verb is? Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the verb. It's at the very beginning of this whole sentence. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. So, if you really want to put the right word into that phrase, wives, be being filled with the Holy Spirit in relationship to your husband. Little spin on the narrative, and the paradigm changes. You see, I think at the most fundamental level in human society, the damage between the man and the woman is at the heart. Sexual abuse issues, the sex trade industry, wars, all of these things are connected to the question, if men are so much more messed up than women, how come they're in charge? Do you want to know the answer? No? Oh, I forgot we're in church. So, I'll think for you. What if? Do you remember this conversation? The enemy says to the woman, and by the way, she's not Eve yet. Her na her, she is designed or designated Isha. Isha, that's the Hebrew word for female. The male word is Ish, I-S-H. Ish and Isha. And Ish means self. And when she is brought forth to him, he says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, ish, self, ah, it's a guy thing, isha, this is me, but in a different form, right? It's very cool. So, in Genesis, Adam is male, female, but the female is asleep within him. She is dormant. He's male, female. Even Jesus, in referencing the divorce issue, refers to the Genesis story and says male slash female. And it says, let us make man, Adam, in our image. In the image of God, he created him male, female. But she's asleep. They have this conversation. God says, you know, on the day you eat of that tree, you know, you can touch everything, you can eat of everything except that tree. On the day you eat of it, in dying you will die, is what the Hebrew says. In dying you will die. On the day, the yom, on the day you eat of it, in dying you will die. She wasn't there for that conversation. She's still asleep. She has created or brought forth a help meet for him. That's old English. I get, I get what it's trying to say, and it's trying to say the right thing, but it just didn't get there. The word help is used only of God or women. You know when you sing, uh, he's our present help in time of trouble? That's the word. And it's referring to God, right? In this passage, it's only used of the woman. She is a help meet is what we would say like you meet, uh, like a meet and greet, uh, you're face to face with. And the best Hebrew rabbinic tradition on this passage translates it 
she was brought forth a power face to face or equal to him. Okay? Now, she wasn't a rib. Hate to tell you that, but that's a myth. She is not fashioned out of his rib. There is a word in the Hebrew for rib. It shows up in Daniel. It's, in the, it's one of those ribs. It's in the mouth of one of the devouring beasts. That's not the word here. The word here is corner or side. She is his other side, his corner. The, she is this other part of him that is now being brought forth. Now, here's the twist. Your good scholarship, the old guys that are mostly dead, they will tell you that Adam had already joined Lucifer when the conversation between Lucifer and Isha takes place. Would that make a difference? Oh, yeah. What's going on here? There is a word, um, the word that we, that's uh, translated keep. Remember that he is, Adam was given um, the uh, ownership of this garden and he was to tend and keep it, right? Remember the word keep? It shows up again. You know where it shows up? Remember the cherubim that were placed with a flaming sword to guard the way back to the tree of life? There to keep it, same word. So they're guarding something from getting to the tree of life inappropriately. He's given the requirement to keep the garden, to keep it safe. From who? Lucifer. And the first time you meet Lucifer, guess where he is? In the garden, having a conversation with who? Her. And who is with them? He is. And who does the guy thing and doesn't say anything? She is quoting what he has told her about what God has said about this tree, and she misquotes it, and Adam doesn't correct her. Nor does Adam step in and say, wait, you're out of line. You shouldn't even be here. He keeps his mouth shut as Lucifer attacks the woman. There is a whole lot more going on here. So, this attack takes place. What is the nature of the attack? It is an accusation against the character and nature of God. Read it. This is the first conversation about God that's in the Bible. And it's in the mouth of Lucifer. It's in the mouth of the accuser. And what does he say? You can't trust God. That's fundamentally what Lucifer's accusation is. You know what? God is not good all the time. There is some darkness in him. And God, you know, he he doesn't want you to become everything that you were created to be. And you can become, you could take the power of God and you could determine what the good is and what the evil is. Because you can't trust him. He'll lie to you. Did he say that? Oh, so sad. There is an accusation against the character of God in the mouth of the enemy. Now, think about how critical this is. We live in a world full of uncertainty. I don't know if you've noticed this. I have friends who just buried their four-year-old nephew from cancer. And I saw him the other day, and he says, Paul, there is nothing right about a four-foot casket. And he is correct. We live in a world full of uncertainty. And we try to create human institutions to try to gain some certainty, even religious ones. And then we try to play games with God to try to get his behavior to be certain. It's called magic. If I do the right things, then God's supposed to do his right things. 
or if I have enough faith. Nobody tells you how much the right things is enough and how much faith is enough, but it's magic. Magic is a way to control things without having to have relationship, without having to trust. Where are we going to find any certainty? It's only going to be in the character and nature of God. If we lose the certainty of his goodness, we are all alone. Because there's no one we can trust except either ourselves or the systems that we create. Does that make sense to you? Okay, let me take you one little step further. Lucifer attacks her. Putting into her mind this question about the certainty of God's character. Adam does not take a stand, and he is there with her. She eats. Do you remember when it says it's not good for a man to be alone? The word alone in the Hebrew is not like solitary, like we would think, oh yeah, it's not good for a man to be alone. Everybody knows that. The word means in the Hebrew, it is not good for a man to be in his separation. And that was before this conversation took place. This is another one of those things that says, Adams, he's already down the hill. He's already gone. Right? He has already joined with Lucifer, and now he is attacking the woman. Why would he be attacking the woman? And the ancient scholarship says, God brings her forth from him to save him. So what happens? They hide all this. God, who had been on Venus for the day doing stuff, comes back and he's furious. He's going, what? I leave for half a day and you mess up the entire cosmos? No. That's not what happens. Right? God knows. He, what's his first question? Tell me where you are. That is a question of relationship, not a question of accusation. He's God. God knows where they are. This is not like some cosmic hide and seek. Right? Come on, tell me where you are. And then he says, first to Adam, but I'm going to switch it up so that you can see the import of this conversation. He says, Isha, tell me what happened. Now, at this point, we have a table in the middle of the garden. Metaphorical. Metaphorical things like parables and, you know, like the shack. It's, it's true, it's just not real. So, On this side of the table, we have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Ish and Isha. On this side of the table, you have Lucifer. Why is Lucifer on this side of the table? Because his finger is in the face of God, going, you're not good, can't trust you, right, right, right? Accusation against the character of God. God says, Isha, what happened? She says, I, I was deceived. He, what does she do? He deceived me and I ate, word for word. Question number one, is she telling the truth? Yes. Every place else in scripture that refers to this situation says she was deceived. She told the truth. She said, he deceived me, right? Now she could have been saying, and he helped them, right? But, she, but he deceived me. Now listen, Ish, Adam, Ish, male, tell me what happened. The woman you gave me. And the man joins Lucifer in an accusation against the character and nature of God. And the whole universe changes. And what does God say to these two? Ish, your salvation is going to come through this woman. Lucifer, your destruction will come through this woman. 
And Ish, you need to leave the garden. Read it. She was never pushed out of the garden, nor was she denied access to the tree of life. She was the first believer. but he was in his rebellious state. And what does God do? He moves him out of the garden. In dying, he will die. But why does God pull him out of the garden? Because he loves him. And physical death now becomes a way to get out of this. What did he say? I don't want you to eat in your rebellious state of the tree of life and live in that state forever. Why did she go? Because she followed him out. But she was never restricted by God from either the tree of life or the, or the garden. She followed him out. And Adam, in his first real act of independent maleness, named his wife, which you did over when you dominated something. You named all the animals because you had dominion over them. He now names his wife, but he names her something unbelievably beautiful. Eve. You know what Eve means? The mother of the living. What does he know about himself? I'm dead. But there's a promise through her seed, the mother of the living. In that conversation, one last little bit and we'll be done. Are you following this? Like, like science fiction, right? I know, I know. So God says to her, before she's named Eve, Isha. Your turning will be to the man. Not like it should be. I'm just saying. Because of this movement of independence, because of the deception, and because of the rebellion, your turning will be to the man, and he'll rule over you. Not should rule over you, not I want this to happen, he's going to. Your turning. It's translated, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Bad translation. It was never desire until the Middle Ages when we had a bunch of monks who didn't like sex or women who started creating all this mythology about ribs and things. Rib is actually from an old rabbinic tradition and we have the quote from where it came from, but it's false. You're turning. Teshuka is the word, and it means, you know how you run back and forth, and at every time you, at the end of your running, you turn. That turning is t, and shuk is to run back and forth. Your turning, your teshuka, will be to the man, and he'll rule over you. What does that mean? Where was she drawn from? Him. She now turns from this relationship to this relationship. At least she turned to a relationship, which is kind of like the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? I mean, she, it's relationship. At least she does that, but she turns. What does she now look for in the man? Everything that she looked for in her relationship with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Identity, worth, value, significance, security, meaning, purpose, destiny, love. And she turns to her proximate source and says, you need to give this to me. Identity, worth, value, significance, security, meaning, purpose, destiny, and love. And what does he do? I can't do this. When you trap shame in a set of expectations, you will either get fight or flight. 
And that is the story of the man's side of relationship. Because they cannot give to a woman the things that she can only draw out of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is why being single works. And this is why Christian teaching on marriage doesn't. Not all of it, but a lot of it doesn't work because what do they say? Woman, you need to be turning to him for identity and worth and value. That's the exact thing that went wrong. What did the man do? And what did God say what he would do? Guess where his turning was? Where was he drawn out of? What was his proximate source? The ground. And he turns to the ground in the works of his hands and he demands of that proximate source what? Identity, worth, value, significance, security, meaning, purpose, destiny, and love. And what does the ground do? Thorns and thistles. Because it can't do it. Men didn't even turn to a relationship. They turned to the ground and the works of their hands. And now they're looking at their jobs and they're looking at their territory and they're looking at their property. And all of a sudden you have war with everybody else who wants their territory and their property. And you're only as good as your last sale. And on and on and on it goes. And meanwhile, the woman is going, would you give me some worth and value and significance and security meaning? And he's going, okay, I don't know how to do this. But I don't want to go to counseling either. So... Do you see the war that exists here? A set of expectations is legalism. It's just a different kind of law. Every expectation is a failure waiting to happen. And men live inside the shame of not being able to be God and provide the things that they cannot. And they're trying to demand of the ground and the works of their hands a sense of worth and value and significance and identity and all that kind of stuff that the ground can't do. What's the call of the gospel? Return! Return! Women, grow up. Turn to the one who can give you identity and worth and value and significance and security. Don't place that on one of us. We can't do it. I'm just telling you. We can't. And we can't live under this burden of trying to be God to you. We would love to do it if we had the power. But we don't. And men grow up, stop looking in terms of territory and property and things and what you do as a basis for who you are. The ground can't do it. And Jesus says, return. And suddenly, what happens if you've got two people who are in a marriage who turn? And they both find their identity and worth and value and significance and security and meaning and purpose and love and destiny in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the guy's not looking at the ground. It's not about an imminent failure and look what's going to happen. And I've got to keep secrets because my wife is going to be terrified if I'm losing my job, really. And I've got to hide everything because I can't live up to her expectations, but I'm really trying. But there's this other woman, and she kind of likes me for who I am, which is BS, but it feels really good because it's like, oh, she doesn't have any expectations. Well, you just wait. <laughs> the problem with affairs is you're going to take yourself into it. And that person doesn't love you because they know you. They love you because they have an imagination of what it's going to take to fulfill the emptiness in their own hearts because they have turned from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Real love is based on knowing Infatuation is based on not knowing. And we are such suckers for infatuation. That's when you start to get to know the person that all this stuff begins to fade and fall apart. You find out, oh, crap, they're a human being. <laughs> the call of the gospel. 
return. That is the kindness of a God who climbs into the mess. I said it in an earlier service, and I want to just reiterate it as the final point. God did not invent the cross, but anticipated it. It was the worst torture device that human beings could ever create, so that is where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit went to camp inside our lostness. The place where we would use this torture device to even kill God. And God says, bring it on. And then he transforms a man-made torture device into a beautiful icon of grace and a monument of compassionate kindness so that we would wear a human-made torture device around our necks and we would go, it's the cross. He took our wrath. He met us at our deepest, darkest places and embraced us. And now he climbs into our messes and begins to transform us from the inside out. There is nothing he doesn't know about you, so there is nothing about you he does not love. But he is after what keeps you from being free because of his love. And his intention is to destroy whatever it is that keeps us from being free. And we're not good at returning, just so you know. We do it in fits and starts, but it becomes more of our life as the broken bits of our hearts are put back together. For freedom he came to set us free because he knew that love that was coerced was no love at all. And we were designed to love freely to the praise of the kind intention of his will, to the praise of his glory. Amen. Thank you.